Welcome to the Dead Celebrities Podcast. In this podcast, we break down high-profile celebrity estate planning cases for advisors and their clients. Most celebrity estate catastrophes are based on the same issues that everyday people face, just with the volume turned up. Our goal is to identify and extract the individual estate planning issues that lie at the heart of each story. We then discuss what advisors should expect and how to avoid common pitfalls. Hosted by WealthManagement.com Senior Editor David Lenick. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of WealthManagement.com's Dead Celebrity Podcast. My name is David Lenick, and I'm a senior editor with WealthManagement.com. For anyone new to the podcast, in each installment, myself and a guest take on a different celebrity estate and attempt to extract some key lessons that planners can apply to their more traditional clients. The idea being that celebrity estate planning catastrophes also although often ridiculous in their details, sort of generally have at their core very basic issues that can just as easily apply to non-famous or fabulously wealthy clients. Joining me today is Letha McDowell. Letha is a shareholder of Hook Law Center, who works primarily with the firm's North Carolina clients. Her practice includes the areas of elder law, special needs planning, state and trust administration, estate planning, asset protection planning, long-term care planning, and tax law. Ms. McDowell has taught numerous continuing education programs on elder law and special needs planning around the nation and has worked on revisions to legislations which affect people with disabilities in North Carolina. Thanks for joining us, Letha. Thanks for having me. So the subject of today's episode is legendary actor and Hollywood icon Marlon Brando. Whether it be as a young hunk in a streetcar named Desire, his now highly controversial performance in Last Tango in Paris, or his Oscar-winning role in The Godfather, Brando was an arresting presence who commanded the audience's attention. Sadly, as he aged, the legendary actor's behavior became increasingly erratic. For instance, during the infamously fraught filming of 1996's The Island of Dr. Moreau, which was one of his final films, Brando's titular character appears several times wearing this odd tubular metallic hat. Uh, That hat was actually a metal ice bucket that the actor would occasionally just show up to set wearing on his head, and he would refuse to remove it. So the director just had to film him while he wore it, and they they wrapped like a piece of cloth around it to make it look like a hat. Uh, That he was eventually diagnosed with dementia really shouldn't have come as much of a surprise. Brando's estate has been the subject of dozens of lawsuits since his death in 2004 at 80 years of age, and many of these suits centered on the lack of clarity surrounding his true intentions as expressed in his will and trust, which he did have. In the weeks preceding his death, Brando was so paranoid that he refused to leave his bedroom and demanded that it be padlocked at night. He was apparently very worried that someone would sneak in to steal the buttons off his shirt while he slept. Yet, despite his clearly deteriorating mental capacity, Brando signed an amendment to his will a mere 13 days before his death. The new will replaced his personal assistant of 50 years and his business manager of 40 years with new executors. Despite accusations of lack of competence, elder abuse, and forgery, Brando's new executors have kept tight control over his estate, image, and legacy. They've been very aggressively litigious, suing everyone from a furniture company that was selling a Brando chair to Madonna for using his image in a concert. The executors also cut a deal involving a private island Brando owned in the South Pacific because of Of course, he owned a private island and allowed it to be turned into a resort. Uh, Whether Brando would have wanted his private island to commercialize this way is but one of many questions asked by those close to the star who have since sued his estate, alleging that the executors haven't honored his intentions, including a number of supposed verbal promises of cash and property he allegedly made to several close confidants. The veracity of these claims is very difficult to parse, largely because of the very same loss of capacity that allowed Brando to potentially be taken advantage of in the first place. Letha, loss of capacity, be it through dementia or some other means, is a very real threat to basically all of our clients, um, particularly those who are getting up there in age. So let's start with the very basics. What are some signs that advisors can look for to determine if their clients may be experiencing some loss of capacity? Well, that's a great question. And um, unfortunately, you know, your advisor isn't they're not sitting at home with the client. So you, some of the things like you mentioned about padlocking the bedroom at night, an advisor's not going to necessarily know about that. On the other hand, if you have had a longstanding relationship with the client and 
they always do X, Y, Z. And then all of a sudden you're getting a call out of the blue that changes the pattern in which they're acting. That's a good sign unless there's some sort of logical reason behind it. Forgetting appointments, that's a pretty common one, or showing up at days and times that are unexpected. Those are things that are pretty easy for an advisor to see. It's challenging because there are often legitimate reasons why somebody without um, cognitive impairment would do that. On the other hand, you want to look for frequency and um, not having legitimate reasons as signs that maybe you should be scratching your head a little bit and thinking a little bit more about the reasoning behind um, what's happening or why the client is um, acting that way. Um, And phone calls, you know, if a client is repeating themselves or you have a conversation and then they call again the next day and you're having the same conversation again and then you have it a week later, that's another indicator that maybe something's going on uh, that requires a little bit more um, investigation. And so if you start to notice these things, you know, some of these, you know, repeatedly missing uh, meetings and normally sort of prompt client missing meetings all of a sudden, or, you know, as you mentioned, uh, these strange phone calls, I mean, what's the first step that you take? How do you, this is sort of a very difficult, obviously, um, subject to broach <laughs> with a client. What do you do first? Right. It's never a good idea to say, hey, I think you have dementia. Let's fix this. Um, That's not a good approach. Not going to get you very far. Um, Hopefully, the client has given you either a protected party or somebody that you can share information with that you might be able to call and say, hey, I've noticed some behavior that's a little bit unusual. And uh, I think maybe we need to have a conversation um, ideally. Or if the client has a power of attorney and you're and it's immediately effective, then that may be somebody to reach out to, to say, hey, I have some concerns, or maybe just getting the client in themselves. And instead of saying, hey, I think you have dementia, hey, I've noticed some things that are a little bit unusual, and I'm concerned. I don't want you to make any decisions that are harmful to you. Can we talk about how we want to handle this, or or what direction do you want me to follow? Um, because just having some mild cognitive impairment or dementia does not mean that somebody is incapable of managing their own affairs. And it's very important to maintain a normal relationship to the extent you can with a client and to provide them with the respect that they they deserve. But at the same time, you want to make sure they're protected so that they don't call and tell you to liquidate some huge portfolio to the tune of a huge capital gain without having thought through this all the way. And I think that's a very important uh, part that you brought up that if if you could, I'd like you to expand on a little bit this idea of some loss of mental capacity is not complete loss of capacity. And that there is sort of a fine line there between someone who maybe is deteriorating or losing it a little bit and someone who is not capable of making decisions. Right. Um, Very interesting. And, you know, it's almost situational. What decisions do they have the ability to make? Um, So being forgetful and forgetting that they have just met with the advisor to review their portfolio last week and they want to review it again, that in itself, it, I, I don't think is a reason to say they don't have capacity. But when they start making decisions or directions that are very obviously in not in their best interest or very obviously bad decisions, that's when it's time to start worrying and seeing if you can get somebody else, family member, friend, trusted advisor involved in order to make sure that they don't make decisions that are harmful to them. And what you really want to look for is change because people make bad decisions all the time, right? And it has nothing to do with dementia. They're just making poor choices. But if you have a client that's made very intelligent, well-thought-out decisions their entire life and then all of a sudden directs you to do something that's just outrageous, that's a problem. And I think... um it's important to sort of keep an even keel when you're sort of judging your clients, right? There's a, an old adage amongst financial advisors, sort of that, like, um, poor people are crazy, but wealthy people are just eccentric. Um, (laughs) sort of like the more money someone has, the more willing, uh, we often are to overlook, uh, you know, some, I guess for lack of a better term, cockamamie behavior, um, as we see with Brando, right? Brando, people were just like, Oh, he's just so difficult. And he's really, as he's, you know, they thought he was just like, a you know, a, a prima donna actor, which to a certain extent he, he probably was, but also to a certain extent he was clearly, you know, mentally ill. So, I mean, 
it's important to keep these things in mind that, you know, that all clients certainly need to be treated equally and you have to keep an even keel of judgment about what's really going on with them. Absolutely. And if a client wants to call you every day to talk about what's going on with their portfolio or whatever you're working on for them, and it's a big client, it, and it's just because they forgot that you had the conversation the day before, what's the harm in taking that phone call other than, yes, I understand that there's certainly time involved. But um, if they're really good clients, usually we're happy to accommodate that. And that, that that doesn't mean that you need to make any changes. That in itself is an indication of some cognitive impairment, but yet there's no harm in taking that phone call. So once you notice, you know, say, unfortunately, you notice some of these cognitive impairments in your clients, is there a point, I mean, obviously, a cognitive impairment is, is a legal concern as well in terms of if you're trying to add to a plan or create new documents. Um, what, where's the cutoff between it being almost too late to sort of try to add new things so the person is too far gone if you haven't already prepared enough for it? Well, um, so having capacity is always a legal determination. It's not necessarily a medical determination, although lawyers will often look to um, physicians and neuropsychiatrists or psychologists to help us determine whether or not somebody has capacity. Um, If the client is clearly unaware of who they are, where they are, day and time, who their children are, you know, the fact that they have an IRA, a Roth IRA, and an investment account, or a regular brokerage account, okay, that's an indicator that they're not capable of making informed decisions. Um, and then it's probably too late to do anything. Um, although you, if they have a power of attorney, you want to take a look at the power of attorney and perhaps the agent under the power of attorney can make decisions. If there is no financial power of attorney, no person that you have the ability to reach out and, um, communicate with about the client, because we do have privacy rules in in place, um, then there are usually um, government agencies that you can call to report um, concerns about abuse, uh, elder abuse, or, and I use that term elder abuse, um, abuse, exploitation, and neglect. And that neglect can even be self-neglect. And when you report, then there are procedures in place to help make sure that that person's protected. And uh, for our listeners, we'll include some of those uh, links to those government agencies in the show notes if you check uh, the podcast page. Ideally, when clients first come to you and you're starting a relationship, um, encouraging them to work with a competent estate planning attorney to make sure that they have something in place is really important. I'd rather see prevention um, and forethought rather than reaction at a time when it may be too late. Um, but I realize that's not always possible. Well, that, yeah, you kind of actually preempted my next question here a little bit. So this is sort of a, 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 pro, a challenge that all clients kind of face down, right? Especially as, you know, longevity becomes, I guess, more of a danger, which is a weird way to, to think about it. But, you know, the, as clients live longer and longer, you know, there's the chance that, you know, most people are going to have some sort of, of loss of mental capacity of some level at some point. So how much of this preventative planning you're talking about, these power of attorneys, things like that, uh, should just become standard practices for all clients, regardless of age. Uh, well, if I can stand on my soapbox for just a minute, um, I would tell you that anybody over the age of 18 should have some sort of sur- surrogate decision-making document, power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney. Um, if you're a parent who has a child in college, you can quickly realize that Yes, you can pay the bill, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the university is going to tell you what their grades are. So uh, um, having those documents in place at any age is important. So I don't, it's not, it's something that we tend to think of as just an old person's move to get a power of attorney or to have a trust. But the truth is it's really relevant at any age. And so I would encourage advisors to encourage all of their clients to have this in place. Can you expand on that college student example a little bit? Because I think that's one that um, maybe to estate planners is pretty familiar, but to uh, you know wealth planners and such, you kind of don't think about it as much because you do think about you know these things for for older people. Right. Well, so we're all at the age of eighteen become you know legally adults, so we can vote and enter into contracts, and we can get credit cards and buy cars, and you know we're autonomous individuals. And so while we still think of an 18-year-old college freshman as being a kid to some extent, 
legally they are adults. And that means that mom and dad no longer have the ability to act or to receive information. Privacy laws uh, apply at that point. And so college students can essentially do what they want without mom and dad's knowledge, but having a power of attorney allow mom and dad or whoever they name to remain involved and to receive information. Yeah, and I think this is a really interesting, a pretty recent development for the most part to, to for advisors to be aware of, right? This idea of, you know, when kids are adults, because I think we're seeing, especially amongst the well-off families, that, you know, quote unquote, kids are living at home and not leaving the house until 25, 30. You know what I mean? And then they're still like, that's my kid. But that's also as a 30 year old adult <laughs> who has, you know, certain powers and responsibilities and legal protections in this case that may interfere with what, you know, you, you may actually end up getting in the way more than they end up protecting them if you're not properly prepared. Right. And just because they're living in the basement doesn't mean that mom and dad still get to make decisions for them. Um, And I often point out when I'm talking to married couples that just because people are legally married doesn't mean that they have the ability to act on each other's behalf either. And I use the example that if I'm in a car accident, my spouse can't call my 401k company and say, uh, we need to make a withdrawal or I need to file a claim um, because they don't, if without a power of attorney, there's no ability to act on my behalf. And so whether it's kids going off to college or spouses, having that second person to make decisions is critical at all stages of life. Yeah, this is just kind of an interesting, uh, apropos of nothing, but you know, in our previous episode, we, we spoke about sort of the challenges faced by LGBTQ um, clients. And this is maybe one area, these areas of uh, healthcare proxies and, and powers of attorney where, where LGBTQ clients actually may be ahead of uh, your more typical heteronormative clients just because they, you know, without having marriage, they were sort of forced to become very familiar with these things. And these were their sort of only options to uh, sort of try to recreate the bundle of rights that marriage presents. So that's, I don't know what that's supposed to mean, but it's just sort of an interesting thing that popped into my yeah, head. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree a hundred percent that um, there have been, uh, yeah, that's, that's a place where we see a lot more advancement than between sort of the um, traditional, yeah, heteronormative couples. So we mentioned we've mentioned power of attorneys a couple of times, healthcare proxies. Are there any other uh I mean less uh less well known vehicles that, that planners should be aware of that, that are, are, are extra useful? Well, certainly when it comes to healthcare, I um, recommend and will always prepare a HIPAA waiver for clients. So um, in most states, having a healthcare power of attorney um, means that you've named a person to act and to make healthcare decisions in the event that you were not capable of making them. So think of being in surgery. I can't make a decision because I'm under anesthesia. Who's going to have the right to say, yes, it's okay to take XYZ course of action. However, um, that's only effective when I don't have capacity. And there's a lot of there at any given point in time, you may want somebody to help you get information in order to help you make decisions, but it doesn't mean that you're incapacitated. Uh, And so having a HIPAA waiver will allow somebody to access your protected health information. Um, For example, you go see a doctor, you get a test result, and you have no idea what it means. You really want somebody else to be able to call and, you know, talk and get that same test result and see if the two of you can sit down and WebMD or Google search and figure out, you know, what does this mean? And where do we go from here? Um, Or in the case where you have an older adult who may have some cognitive impairment, but they're not legally incapacitated, it could be useful to have um, family members or whoever you've named as a healthcare agent to be able to communicate with doctors to find out, well, what really did happen at that appointment? And am I understanding this correctly? Um, So that is something that I've seen not everybody comes away from their estate plan with. And then certainly using uh, a trust, um, it, not appropriate for in all circumstances. I, I mean, a lot of it depends on asset level, state law, what your goals are. Um, but having a trust, if appropriate, is a way that um, a successor trustee could manage in the event of a disability such as dementia or cognitive impairment. Although um, I would say that the power of attorney and trustee um, work together. And so um, you may have assets in a trust, and so the trustee can manage those assets. But yet, if you get a $5,000 power bill, the trustee can't call the power company and say, why is this a $5,000 power bill? Because it's not 
how that works. But the agent and power of attorney can call to say, hmm, something doesn't seem right here. Let's investigate further. And so it, it let's just say it is a legitimate $5,000 power bill, then the trustee can pay it, but those functions need to cooperate. So let's bring this all together, I guess. And you have done your diligence and, and you put all these things in place and you have a client, you know, I guess like Brando, who's sort of uh, in and out, let's say. They're not clearly incapacitated. They have, you know, they're lucid and they want to do something strange with their estate. What is that? Like, what, what is the I think they're sort of kicked the beehive? What does that end up looking like? Does, does it just become a, a group effort now of you're, you're bringing in all the people all the advisors and all the people who are named in these documents to sort of like parse whether this should be allowed to go through? Well, uh, um, you know, that's where you have this issue of capacity and whether or not somebody does have legal capacity to um, do something strange. Because if you take away the, you know, possible cognitive impairment and somebody just decides all of a sudden they want to leave their entire estate to their dog, well, we all have the right to do that, right? Um, And so you don't, want the incapacity or potential cognitive impairment to overshadow that. However, a good planner is going to know, you know, this is unusual and this is going or likely will result in some sort of litigation. So let's make sure all of the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. So um, often if we're getting this sort of unusual change, I will have the client go see a um, neuropsychiatrist to get an exam uh, to, you know, confirm that the client has the ability to understand the nature and extent of their actions. I clearly document my meetings with the client um, to, and to make sure that the client is not subject to undue influence. So I'm meeting with them privately. I'm making sure that they're in a safe situation that if they want to tell me, no, you know, somebody is forcing me to do this, that I can get them out of that in a way that's not going to, um, potentially upset the influencer working with all of the advisors. So I don't like to do anything in a vacuum as an estate planning attorney. I want to get the CPA involved. I want to get the financial advisor involved. So that way we're all on the same page and aware of what these changes are. Um, And a lot of times there'll be insights from other advisors that the client hasn't given me as the estate planner and likewise. So it a, becomes a team effort, but it's the team of advisors and the, the client as opposed to necessarily the other people in the documents, like the executor, um, although sometimes you do have the trustee involved, depending on how the trust is set up. Well, Lisa, we're running out of time here, so I'm going to put you on the spot at the end here and uh, ask you to take this sort of vastly complex issue and try to boil it down to, to maybe one lesson. What's, what's the one thing, if you could you know, tell all advisors one thing about you know, these issues of dementia and lack of capacity that you wish just everyone knew? Oh, wow. That really is putting me on the spot, isn't it? <laughs> um, I would say plan early and get to know your clients. That's the biggest, um, that's the biggest um, takeaway for most people. And that's really how you recognize that there are problems is if you see a change in behavior. And if you don't know your clients well, you won't be able to identify that change in behavior. So um, having them plan early and then just continuously being involved, meet with them regularly, whether it's annually, quarterly, whatever's appropriate for you and your practice, but know what's going on. Well, everyone, that's all the time we have for today's episode. I'd like to thank our absolutely awesome guest, Letha McDowell. Well, thanks. I'm thrilled to be here. (laughs) <laughs> we're thrilled to have you and uh for all our listeners i'll uh see you next time or i guess you'll hear me next time thank you for listening to the dead celebrity podcast click the subscribe button below to become notified when new episodes become available the information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of InformaWealthManagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.